Today, uh, I've changed the title of this in order to, and we'll get into that a little bit, Stewardship of Tangible Resources. Tangible means that you can hold, right? So that's, we're going to be dealing with that today, and I'll talk about what that means. Next week, we will have Stewardship of Influence, and then October 2nd, I call it Call to Action. I may fill in some of the blanks, some of the gaps, talk about what this means in terms of how we live our Christian life. Um, and then the final exam, of course, will be in the second hour. So, as we have always started um, with the issue of what is stewardship, we can define stewardship as the conducting, supervising, or managing of something, especially the careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. In other words, a steward, one who practices stewardship, is someone who cares for something that belongs to someone else. The analogy that I give you is like the manager of a business. The manager is responsible for making sure everything is done, the inventory is maintained, the shop is open when it should be, that it's clean, it's well run, the people are trained, but he doesn't own the thing. And yet the success or failure of it is put in, entrusted to his hands. That's what a steward is. It's like a manager of property that that person doesn't own, but that they do have responsibility for. As Christians, we know that all things are made by God and still belong to Him. We are called to be stewards of everything that God places or entrusts in, in our lives. And that means everything. We talk about um, whole life stewardship. That Christian stewardship has to do with every aspect of our lives. Everything we have, everything we are, everything we think or do, all of that is something we have a responsibility for in terms of how we use it for God. That's part of what it means to be a Christian. We're going to talk about that a little bit specifically as we get into things in terms of the whole life stewardship, as I've called it, is the summing up of all of what it means to be a disciple of Christ. You know, how do we live our lives? What do we do with this life that we have and everything that's in it? That's what it means to be a disciple of Christ, and that's what it means that, uh, to when we talk about whole life stewardship with a Christian. Now today we want to talk about tangible resources. Tangible resources are of two types, money and material possessions. The fact is that most people, when they talk about stewardship, this is what they're talking about. The one additional thing is that there's been a lot of, a lot of um, talk in recent years, that's not a negative, I mean it's just a topic of conversation in recent years, has also been stewardship of the earth. You know, what do Christians have in terms of responsibility to the earth? And a lot of conservative Christians have got that really screwed up. You know, they interpret when, when Adam was told to you know, rule over the earth and subdue it, that means that we're to crush it under our heel if we need to in order to make it do what we want it to do. That's not what Christian stewardship of the earth is. I'm not going to go any further with that. But stewardship of the earth means to care for it, to nurture it, to encourage it. You remember that the earth they were first called on to care for was a garden. You know, you don't care for a garden by, by disregarding the health of the plants. Okay? Um, so, today though we're going to be talking about the things that most people think about when they talk about stewardship in a Christian context. When, you, when they talk about a minister giving a stewardship sermon, what's it about? Money. Money. It's about giving. We're talking about stewardship in the whole context, but today we are going to talk about money and material possessions. Money would include all financial assets doesn't just mean the cash you've got in your pocket. That would be too limiting. Any liquid financial assets you have, anything that you can turn into cash, anything you can spend, you know, uh, as a first act by, by that, I mean, you don't have to take it and sell it to somebody. You can spend it. And secondly, material possessions. That includes everything else that you own that has potential value. Your home, your car, your clothing, all your other earthly goods. Anything that can be converted to cash if you ever really needed to. You may not be, get much money for your clothes, but you could sell them, all right? So money and material possessions, your liquid financial assets, and then those other material possessions that you have that could be, uh, that have a potential value. Now, the thing we have to understand, and this goes back to what we've said all along, money and material possessions both are a result of God's favor and blessing on us, rather than a result of our personal achievements. Like all the created world, those res these resources belong to God. He gives us the privilege of using them, enjoying them, and managing them for His glory. All of our tangible resources, like everything else, belong to God. Now, it's astonishing how few people really believe that, if they've ever thought about it, which is another problem. 
I had a man in our church say to me one time, you know, my money is my money. I worked for it. I earned it. I am not going to give it to somebody else just because they won't go out and work for a living, which is his evaluation of anybody that is poor. Um, that's a sin because it's not his money. He said, it's my money and I've worked for it. And a lot of people think that way. Where did he get the life, the strength, the muscles, the brains, the opportunity, you know, the educational opportunity, his job opportunities, where did all that stuff come from? What gave us the ability to earn the money we have? What gave us the ability to work in order to be able to be paid for things? God did. All of that is things God entrusted to us. And the fruit of those labors that come from all that God has made us able to do, or the opportunities he's given us, all of that is from God, and all of the fruit of that belongs to God. Nothing is outside God's rightful claim of ownership. Okay? Questions about that? Again, it's astonishing to me how, how many people have the attitude, this is mine. Mine. The minute we say this is mine as a way of saying, therefore, God doesn't have a claim on it, we have sinned. We have sinned grossly. Pam. When and I'm not saying where it would come under. Wouldn't children be also a God gift? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, today we're talking about tangible things which people have the most trouble turning loose on. Oh. Uh, but it's true. I mean, when we say whole life stewardship, everything, including our children and our spouses and everything else belongs to that. But it's been said that the strongest nerve in the body is the one that connects our heart to our pocketbook. <laughs> it's the one that we're least willing to suffer. Okay. Um, and it's a huge problem. The, the lure, the attraction, the addiction to money and material possessions, and I've said this before, is the most significant barrier to spiritual growth in people in the Western world. Not so much in the, in the rest of the world, but in the Western world, meaning us. The, our addiction to money and material possessions is the thing that keeps us most from growing closer to God because we love those things more than we love God. We're not willing to give them up. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Because biblical stewardship of our money and material possessions requires us as Christians to view money differently than the way the secular world views it. I've said before, we, have a, we Christians have a completely different economy. And that means more than just money. It means, you know, what do we place value in. But it also, it especially means money. Bob? Interestingly, there was a study that just came out yesterday that showed that the United States was the number one country in the world in charitable giving by far ahead of anyone else. And also interesting was the last two countries were Greece and China. Mm -hmm. Well, we are uh, by far the most charitable country in the world and have been for a long time, but not by per capita. The reason that we are the most charitable country in the world, the United States, is because of the Bill Gateses in the world. The year that Bill and Melinda Gates launched the Gates Foundation, they were responsible for one third of all the charitable giving on the planet. So, yes, as a nation, we are, but individually, we fall way down the list. Okay? And that to me is the thing that counts. I mean, that's the one that matters is how are we individually uh, motivated to charitable causes? But you're right, the U.S. has always been uh, the most charitable country uh, on the planet. Uh, one, one study was done and said that if those people who profess to be Christians, and by that we mean church attending Christians in the United States, if they would all tie, just give 10%, and we're only talking about American Christians now, there would be enough money that everyone on the planet would have enough to eat and clean water and sanitation and education. If just American Christians would all tie, which should be the minimum that we feel is a responsibility. Okay? I don't. You look at somebody like Bill Gates, who's not even a believer, although Bill Gates has said in interviews that he, when he looks at the things in the world, he finds it hard to believe that there isn't a God out there, which is a step. You know? He may not be far from getting it. Um, I mean, they're, he's committed, he and his wife Melinda are committed to ending malaria, you know, to pick out major diseases that cause huge. You know, problems in terms of illness and death in the world and solve the problem. Okay, and they're giving 
millions and millions and hundreds of millions of dollars to address those kind of problems. And we can't give 10% of whatever it is we have. Now you can say, well, that's not 10% of this giving. Well, they're giving a huge amount. And, and yeah, he's got more left over, and you know, we can't, those parallels only work so far. But the fact is that if all of us would give just 10%, the world would be changed. In the name of Jesus. Don't forget that one. Okay. The secular world equates affluence, which means the gaining and holding of money, with success and happiness. Those things are equal in the secular world's view. And so struggles, the secular world struggles constantly to acquire as much wealth as possible. They believe, the world believes, the secular world believes that money will make me happy. Material possessions will make me happy. <clears throat> and the reason why, and it's setting, setting aside mental illness, and that's a real issue, but apart from mental illness, the reason that so many people who are, who become famous and rich, everybody knows their name, they can go anywhere they want and do whatever they want, why do you think so many of those people end up blowing their brains out? Because their whole life has been oriented around this idea that if I can gain that level of affluence and success and popularity and visibility, then I'll be happy. They get it, and they're more miserable than they ever were before, and they realize that's not going to make them happy. They don't know where to go from there, and so they take their own lives. I think it's as simple as that. Now again, there are some people who, who commit suicide and who do so because of mental illness. Um, and I, I'm not making light of that at all. In fact, it's all, I would almost go so far as to say it's a kind of mental illness to think that popularity and money and fame uh, and influence is going to make you happy. Now, that's, that's a lie of the devil. Um, and so that's the way the world thinks. Christians, on the other hand, believe what the Bible says. And the Bible reveals to us the worthlessness of struggling for affluence, struggling for money. And the Bible reveals the truth about money in many, many different ways. Psalm 49.12 says, People, despite their wealth, do not endure. They are like beasts that perish. You know, the one who dies with the most toys still dies. Okay, You've seen the bumper sticker, the one who dies with the most toys wins? That's what the world says. The fact is, they still die. We all end up in the same place. Ecclesiastes 5 says, whoever loves money never has enough. Remember, this was written, we believe, by Solomon. At least this person claims to be king over Israel and a son of David and apparently is a person of considerable wealth because he has, he builds, you know, public works and he builds houses and he has slaves and singers and banquets and he, you know, he can afford anything. And he says, whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. As for the rich, their abundance permits them no sleep. Money will not give you what you think you want. The world is wrong. Scripture is right. Now this is very serious business. As I said earlier, and I mean it, I very much mean it. I believe money and material possessions are the primary spiritual barrier that Western, Westerners cannot overcome as they seek to grow closer to God. That's the thing that's keeping us away from God. It's serious business and it requires serious attention. Our being able to fight against what the world says, the whole world says, everything on television, everything you hear, everything you see in the world, tells you making more money is the goal, being richer is the goal. All right? Apart from the things of the church. I wonder sometimes if the way we think is not necessarily we need more money, but we need other people to see that we have more money. Well, the influence aspect of it. When we talk about next week. <laughs> well, no, when, when we talk about influence or affluence, I mean, affluence means all those things. Yeah. But the, the the fact is that money is the primary thing that drives that. Um, Somebody once, you know Sarah Bernhardt, actress? Somebody asked Sarah Bernhardt one time, would you rather be um, rich, pretty, or famous? And she said, honey, rich can buy you pretty and famous. <laughs> She's not very pretty. <laughs> Sarah Bernhardt. But, I mean, that's the idea that money is the thing that's going to get you there. With money, you can do anything. In fact, um, I had a, a pastor's wife one time said, money won't make you happy. But money will let you take happy a lot more places. <laughs> and there is some truth in that. Don't, don't misunderstand. Neither I nor scripture 
says money isn't important. Money is important. Money is the, is the medium by which a lot of things get done or don't get done. You know, churches aren't, don't get built. Ministries don't go forward without the exchange that the world has decided that they're prepared to use for labor and materials and all sorts of things. So I'm not discounting money. I'm just saying that money has its right place and its wrong place. And most of our culture puts money in the wrong place. And the only way we overcome that is by being aware of it and by being very intentional about not following the way the world goes with regard to money and material possessions. We have to, we have to think about this. We have to pay attention or it's not going to be different for us. To be intentional, to be committed, to persevere in our opposition to the way the world thinks about money. Okay. Um, now, again, what we were just saying, um, Christians are not called to despise money or refuse money. God does not call everyone to complete renunciation of material wealth and poverty. He does some people, and that's fine. That's their call. But we must have a right relationship with money. And we must use it in the correct way, which means in a God-honoring way, toward the purposes that God would desire. A couple of verses here, 1 Timothy 6, 9, and 10. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Now, three times in that one passage, it tells you it is not money that's the problem. It's not even being rich that's the problem. It is the want to get rich. It is the love of money. It is being eager for money. Okay. Now, people who are rich and in their richness they disregard the needs of others, they're sinning. So there, there is a downside to being rich. If you're rich and you just sit back on your butt and you don't do anything with that money when there are people around you who are in need, then that's wrong. But being rich by itself is not, you know, money is not wrong. Having money is not wrong. Craving money and hoarding money are wrong. It's been said it's not wrong to have money, but it is wrong to hoard money, not to share it. Hebrews 13.5 says, Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Now what does that verse say? You see the juxtaposition of things there? He's sufficient for everything. Right, but there's a juxtaposition. There's two points being made there that are counterpoints. That, Chris? that money will leave and forsake you? Oh, yes. Exactly. Well, um, well but you know, you can lose you. Well, if, you, if, if your focus is on love of money, God's saying don't do that. Don't love money. Don't, don't you know, crave money. And what's his answer when he says, you know, don't go crave money? What's the alternative? Seek God. Because I won't forsake you. I won't leave you. Well, he will provide. So money goes away. Have to worry about having the money to... Well, I think the point here, though, is not that. I mean, he does make that point elsewhere. Here he's saying... Money's not the point. I'm the point. Your, your desire for money isn't going to get you there. Your desire for me will achieve what you want. Bob? I was reading about J. Paul Getty the other day, who at the time was one of the richest, or maybe even the richest man in the world. Mm -hmm. And it said that his, in his private home, he had a payphone installed, and he met, installed and he made his guests use the payphone. He wouldn't let them use the regular phone. Yeah. And his son had a brain tumor, and he got all over his wife because she was spending too much money for medical treatment. For the son, I think he finally died of his brain tumor. And then his grandson was kidnapped, and they wanted like a $20 million ransom. And uh, J. Paul's personal philosophy was that he would not give more than one million for a ransom. And so they finally got it down to three million. And then he made his son borrow the other two million at interest to pay off the ransom. Yeah, well, our culture is full of messed up people with regard to money. Did you have? Okay. Uh, John? Just a couple of comments. Um, in Hebrews 13, 5, 
uh, I see your point there, but one point that really stands out there is this issue of contentment. I don't see a lot of content people. I don't see a lot of content Christians. And the secret, I think, to good administration of the tangible assets that we have is a deep founded contentment in Christ. Right. And then I would also comment, Jesus said it succinctly in Luke 13, where he says, take care, be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Right. And he makes it very clear. That's a radical departure from what we're most... Uh, Absolutely. That's a part we're making. And I'm, I'm going to get... We'll get to that verse as well and what Jesus had to say about that. And the contentedness, you're right, I didn't use that word, but in effect that's what I was saying, is that money, God's here is saying, money will not make, give you contentment. I will. And most people choose money over God. That's why I say it's the biggest single hurdle. Well, I, well my point is, is that although that does deal with contentment in the context of money, I look at contentment in a much broader context. If money is just one of those ways you measure it. Well, if, uh, the point is, if we are content in God, then exactly. money's not an issue. Or anything else. Yes, exactly. Now, one of the things we need to realize, too, is that while money is not, you know, we're not to despise money, we're not to refuse it, money itself is not, is not the problem. It's love of money, it's desiring money, craving money, making that the thing we, we try to find our contentment in. At the same time, there is a very strange thing in the New Testament where Jesus almost personifies money. In fact, he does personify money in terms of its ability to seduce us. You almost get the sense that Satan has in a uniquely possessed or entered into money in a way that it makes it a seduction for us. Um, Jesus, for instance, when he says, no one can serve two masters, Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You see the personification of money there? Money can be our master. While money, in, in one way, money itself is not good or evil. It's just the medium that, our, that the world works in. Jesus gives us a very strong caution, I believe, as though the seductive power of money is almost as though it were a per it could be a personified evil. And we need to be aware of that. That's back to what I said a minute ago, that we, we can't by accident overcome the effort of the world to make money the point. We have to be intentional about that. We have to be spiritually astute about that. We have to seek our contentment in God in order to make sure we're not getting our contentment in the money. Okay? But it's fascinating when you read what Je you know, Jesus talked more about money and material possessions than anything else other than the kingdom of God, which was presence of God in Jesus in their midst. Okay? It was a huge deal to him. Money was a major issue. Why? Because money is a major problem, spiritual. So because of this issue of you know, the effect of money, I think we need to see that generosity is one of the primary ways in which Christians evidence the fruit of the Spirit at work in their lives. If someone is not generous to the extent that they're able to, and we're going to talk about that difference in a minute, then there's a problem with them spiritually. You cannot have a spirit-filled life, by that I mean where the fruit of the spirit, I'm not talking about the gifts of the spirit here, but the fruit of the spirit, you know, the evidence of the presence of the Holy Spirit in your place in Jesus Christ, you can't have that if generosity is not part of your lifestyle. Penny pinchers do not manifest evidence of the fruit of the Spirit in their lives. It simply isn't there. It can't be. We have a number of examples, however, where generosity is shown as being evidence of God's presence in someone's life, evidence of the fruit of the Spirit, even amongst a Gentile who has not yet met Jesus. This first quote from Acts 10 is about Cornelius, the Roman centurion, the first Gentile convert to Christianity, he and his family. Cornelius is praying, and it actually is twice in uh, Acts 10.4 and in 10.31, they repeat the same thing. It says, the angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. In other words, his righteousness 
was demonstrated by his prayers, but also, and it's listed equally, by his willingness to be generous to those who were poor. It was reflected as a spiritual quality, a positive spiritual quality in him, that he was generous. Then James 1.27, James writes, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Now, in many ways, those two examples there, you know, what is, what is pure and faultless religion in God's eyes? What is the pure and faultless way to, to show our faith, to express our faith, to live our faith in God's eyes? To look after orphans and widows in their distress and keep oneself from being polluted by the world. That doesn't mean don't ever have anything to do with the world. We can't be salt and light to the world if we never get close enough for them to touch us and you know, see us. Or, yeah, touch us and see us. What it means is don't go the way the world goes. Don't fall into their trap. And what is the primary trap that we're talking about the world laying for us right now? Trying to convince us that money is the point. And so I believe that it's legitimate to see this passage in 1, 1, James 127 is talking about exactly that. Showing generosity is a sign of pure, faultless religion, not falling into the trap of the polluted world, a primary plank of, which, of the platform of the world being money is the point. Acquiring money is the goal. Right? Pam, you had your hand up? No. Okay. And then uh, Galatians 2, 9, and 10. This is uh, Paul talking about his visit to Jerusalem. James, Cephas, and John, those esteemed pillars, and he goes on to say that they commissioned he and Barnabas to go to the Gentiles and they to the Jews, agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Sorry, I just said that. All they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I had been eager to do all along. When Paul and, Bar uh, and um, um, Barnabas are commissioned by the church council in Jerusalem, they bless them, lay hands on them, send them out to minister, especially to Gentiles. The major concern they, they gave them, the only real thing that, that was an add-on was, don't forget to care about the poor. Don't forget to show generosity to those in need. Okay. Um, so this idea of people who claim to be Christians and they clearly don't demonstrate any kind of generosity in their life, toward people, especially toward people in need, for the things of the kingdom, toward the things of God. They need to deal with that. It is not for me to say that their, their faith and perhaps even their salvation is in question, but they need to ask themselves that question. It's that serious a deal based on what scripture says. Yes? I think that you display and live um, with the generosity of spirit because we have this Holy Spirit inside us and are able to put it to work and project it outwards, then the natural flow of funds, et cetera, should follow through. Mm -hmm. um, you know, whether it's helping a family who's just had uh, a death in the family, and you know more to take a meal to them. Uh, that is your funds that were entrusted to you going for service to others. Right. And it's I, so simple. I agree with that. And while I'm talking about this in terms of a responsibility, because that's the nature of what we're talking about here, in our real everyday Christian lives, this should not be seen as a duty as much as an opportunity. You know, to give thanks to God by giving back to the things of God. And that and we do have some intention, we have to have some intentionality about that, or else we're not serious about the things of God. John? You know, um, just to, to, to make a point of how foreign this is to the way we live today. Mm -hmm. In one of the classes I was teaching in our Bible Institute, it speaks about the fall in, in, in Adam and Eve. And when they begin to labor, when they begin to work, and have to earn their keep by the work of the, the sweat of their brow, I suggested that it was there that markets were born, that commerce was born, mm -hmm. that money was born. That's where the root was as a result of the fall. And so today, what you have this so inbred in our lives, which is part of it, that's part of it, the, and these principles help us to interface with that. But to see the, the values that Christ presents are so foreign 
to the values that the world embraces. And the reason may very well be because its origins were found in the Garden of Eden when they, when they, when they sinned and, and, and began to have to work. What does that mean? That means you pay me for what I do. And then that leads to all the other you know, interchange. Well, I think, I think there's truth in what you're saying. Now, they, they were ordered to work before. They were told to take care of the garden. But yeah, the but difference was they did it in joy. They did it for satisfaction. And they knew that God was going to provide for them. There wasn't a quid pro quo. There wasn't you put in eight hours a day and I will give you yeah. food to eat. Exactly. There was not that. You're absolutely right. Um, we One of the things that we've missed is that we've so wrapped money around the idea of work that we work for money. That's the reason we have jobs. Instead of work being something that is, as originally designed, something that is intended to meet a basic human need, the, the need to be productive, the need to do something instead of just laying around, you know, getting fatter all the time, like a lot of people do, like a lot of us do. Um, the, there is a satisfying aspect to work which people completely miss because they do things they hate and were not intended to do and never should do in order to get the money because the focus is on the money rather than on doing what we were made to do, how we're made in God's image, which involves creating and making and working. Um, you know, our God is the God who made the world. Um, and yeah, you're right, we get that all screwed up. Uh, the idea of that every person, to a great extent, is a slave. You know, everybody in the working world is a slave. The idea, of, they call them wage slaves. There's a number of different theories. G.K. Chesterton was involved in a theory called distributism, which he defined as three acres and a cow, which means give everybody just sufficient means to be self-supporting, to provide for themselves, rather than have to do back-breaking, you know, soul-destroying labor for someone else and be given money as a medium by which you then are supposed to try to meet your needs, whether that's sufficient to do it or not, to provide the means for, for each person. And again, that's sort of a return to the garden kind of idea. Um, it, it wasn't practical. In the world that we have today, distributism is still a concept, but nobody's ever going to make it really work, uh, despite some community's efforts to try to do that. And yet, the concept behind it, that we shouldn't be working for money. We should be working to meet our basic needs and because God created us to work. But we've got all that messed up. And why? Because we've got it so intertwined and wrapped around and buried under the whole idea of making money. And making more money. Even if I have to do something that is killing me physically or more importantly spiritually. And the exception to that would be a guy like Ross Arnold. <laughs> pastors without a salary. Who does it for no money. Exactly. You know, I'm or a missionary who lives by faith. Yeah, I'm, I'm able to do it because God has provided other means. Those means have gotten kind of thin lately, but they, you know. Um, and one of my seminary professors, and, and this is an idea of the right understanding about this. He was talking to pastors in training. This was in pastoral theology. He said, don't ever make the mistake or let your church elders, your board, make a mistake of thinking that you are doing a job and they are paying you to do that job. The minute you let them think that way, you're in trouble. Because they're going to start telling you what you can say and what you can do and what you can't say and what you can't do. As a minister, as somebody, you know, and this ought to be true for every Christian, you know, if we've got, our, if we've got our, our orientation right. But as a minister especially, the idea is that I don't work for them, I work for God. I'm fulfilling the, God, the call God put on my life. That's my job. Their job is to provide for my material needs, in most cases, so that I don't have to worry about that, so that I can focus on fulfilling the, God, the call God gave me. But when they start thinking I work for them, and because they're paying me, they can tell me how I'm supposed to fulfill that call, everything's messed up. You know, I have the advantage of not, you know, not being paid, so nobody can really tell me anything I don't think is contrary to the Word of God. That doesn't mean I don't want to listen. It doesn't mean I don't take counsel. Or, you know, in our, our session has the power to tell me they don't need me anymore. Okay, that's, there are checks and balances in there. But the bottom line is, by not receiving money, by not involving money and the dangers of money in that whole process, then I'm free to listen to what I think God is telling me and not what somebody else wants me to do. Okay? Um, there are real problems whenever you get money in the mix of that kind of thing. And so, and anybody involved in ministry especially, needs to be very clear with whoever their church 
leaders are, what the arrangement is. You're not paying me in order to do a job for you. You are meeting my financial needs, my material needs, so that I can do the job God has called me to do. It just happens to be right here. You know? And again, we as Christians can find a way to, to implement that same kind of thinking in our lives, that we are doing what God has called us to do, and whatever means are necessary to provide us the financial support to keep body and soul together while we do it, that should be the right balance. That's sort of what Chester was going after when he said three acres and a cow. One, one great privilege Judy and I have had as missionaries, we've been missionaries for 30 years, lived by faith for 30 years, and he's always been faithful. But he chooses to do that through men and women who support our ministry. Right. When I go back home, I just, I, I fail with the words to be able to tell them how much we appreciate that because what they do is they provide for us and in so doing, frees me to be honest with the text here in Mexico right. when I'm speaking to people because I'm not I'm not bartering the truth for an income. Right, exactly. Yeah, and I, I had somebody recently tell me that um, he didn't like the fact that we had a couple of men who wore hats in church. And he didn't just didn't like it. He thought this was the most important issue in the world at that point. And I said, you know what? Uh, the thousand things I have to deal with that I think are important, that doesn't even make the list. And I would rather a man be here with his hat on than not be here. And so I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to make it. He wanted me to announce it and tell men they had to leave if they weren't taking and all kinds of stuff. And when I said I'm not going to do that, he said, well, you're a coward. <laughs> I said, really? As long as you've been hearing me preach, you really think that I'm afraid to say what I think needs to be said? That's not something that needs to be said. Okay, and the point is, there's no pressure because there's no money involved. Okay, so, and I think we all would desire to be there in our Christian life, but that does not end up being a thing that has to motivate us or drive us toward things. Uh, but that we have a relationship with money where it is simply a means to accomplish what we feel God has called us to do. All right, now, our goal in being good stewards of money, since money isn't the point, but still, it is a, a reason. You know, it is the way the world works. And you can't just sort of blow it off unless you want to join a cloister monastery. Our goal in being good stewards of money and material resources is to invest them in ways that bring the greatest spiritual return and honor to God. How can we spend money in ways that will honor God? Now, part of it means taking care of our families. All right? That's part of it. But give to the things of God. Show compassion to those in need. And it does not matter how much you have. How much you have to invest for the things of God is unimportant. How you invest it is very important. The reason I like the idea of a tithe, now understand, Christians are under no obligation to tithe in the way that Old Testament was. You know, the requirements in the Old Testament was that you give a tenth of everything, even a tenth of your herbs and you know, the mint and the whole thing. A tenth of everything, of your flocks and herds and money, we are no longer under that obligation. But we should, out of a desire to give back to God in gratitude for generosity, a tenth of what we have, to me, is a minimum. I mean, not because we have to, but because we should want to, as a way of saying thank you. And the reason I, one reason I like the idea of saying a tenth as a sort of rule of thumb is that's whether you've got $200,000 or $100,000 or $5,000 or $1,000 or $10. You can have a pretty clear sense of what, you know, what is, a, what is a way of saying thank you to God by giving financially. In other words, it's a very easy formula to apply to whatever resources you have. How much doesn't matter. Whether we give a lot or a little, we can still give generously joyously and sacrificially. I've said this before, C.S. Lewis, when asked one time, how much should a person give to the things of the church? Lewis said, I can't really tell you how much it should be, except that everyone should give more than they can spare. Sacrificially. I think this is one of the reasons why it talks about when you're giving, don't let your right hand know, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. 
In other words, don't try to keep the accounting down to such a fine point that you're saying, oh no, we can't give to that need, but go, we've already given our tithe this month, so we can't be generous towards some need that's just come up. That's paying too close attention to the accounting. And that's what I think the scripture is saying exactly when it says, with regard to giving, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Don't keep too tight a control. Don't pay that much attention that you limit yourself to a maximum. But be open when the Spirit of God speaks to you to give. It's not how much. It's how we invest it. And that needs to be with an open hand. I think our um, text is a really fine quotation that I hope I'll never forget. God been given giving is a private demonstration. Mm -hmm. It's not for glory and all that stuff. Right. It's not a public display. Right. So it's, and I had been asked, how much do you give, you know? And then I was told I didn't give enough, and I was sitting in the wrong pew and all sorts of things. I mean, we don't have pews, so that wasn't here. No, it was, not here. it was not here. This is the most welcoming, giving, caring congregation. Yeah. I hate to call it congregation because it is a group of people who have right. a common uh, love for Jesus but for humanity. Well, when we say it doesn't matter how much, that's not important, but rather how we how we give. How, well, that means giving from our heart. Now, saying how much doesn't matter, by that I mean it doesn't matter if it's a dollar or ten dollars or a hundred thousand dollars. But how much in terms of it should be something that means something to you. Okay? If you if you give an amount that you know means nothing to you, it, it doesn't, there's no, you're not even aware of it. It's it's pocket change then you probably aren't giving enough. Um, I told the story. When I was at World Vision, we had a campaign for the famine in East Africa. And we were calling some of our mid-level donors. Mid-level donors in that case were people that had given 500, you know, like 100 to $500 single gift. Well, one of the, and we had young people doing this, you know, younger workers calling these people. Well, a guy called this woman um, and said, uh, well, if you could give $1,000 right now, this is what we could do in terms of feeding people in East Africa. And she said, well, that's interesting. What could happen if I gave $10,000? And he's got all these notes about, you know, all the dollar handles and breakdowns, and he's going, oh, well, if you gave $10,000, she said, that's great, that's wonderful. What if I gave $100,000? And he's like, after, you know, wetting his pants, but he's coming up with all this kind of, you know, and she, well, a couple of days later, they got a certified check for $100,000 because of that telephone call. Now, if that woman had given a thousand dollars, another story from World Vision again um, that I'm sure I've told in here. We had a guy who had worked for us in West Africa as a water hydrologist, you know, and, and we had we needed people with very technical skills like hydrologists who spoke French, because this was in French West Africa, who were Christians. You know, it, it, it was a fairly small list. I mean, we wanted to be Christian. Sometimes we had to just have them on contract rather than employees in order to do it technically. Well, this guy had come back from, uh, it was off contract with World Vision, come back to the States, and he started contacting major donors that had been brought over by World Vision that he had met when they came over to see the work there. And he was contacting them, asking them to, to fund what he was doing now, which had nothing to do with World Vision. Well, a couple of us directors uh, were tasked to call some of these major donors and say, we're not, we're not trying to jump on him. He did good work for us. We're not even sure what he's doing right now, but we do want to make sure you understand if, if he has approached you, and he under, we understand he's approaching people, that he does not work for World Vision anymore. If you give to support that, that's not a World Vision project, and we need to make sure you understand. Well, I called a woman, and she said, well, you know, it's funny you called today, because I had lunch with him yesterday, and I think I gave him a check for $10,000, but I'll have to go back and look. <laughs> I swear to you, that's what she said. <laughs> So someone who can write a check for $10,000 at lunch today and tomorrow, not even remember if she did it, probably can afford to give more. And by that, I don't, I'm not talking about just how much can we get out of them. I'm saying for her benefit. For her to feel as though she's giving in a way that is meaningful to her, clearly needs to be more than $10,000 at a pop because she didn't even remember. Okay? So... This idea of giving generously, joyously, and sacrificially, it's what Lewis said about it needs to be more than you can spare. It's got to be enough that you notice it, or it's not enough. 
John? I, I'm sorry, I didn't see that last point there, and I was going to point out that's exactly what Paul said that we should give generously, sacrificially, and joyously. Mm -hmm. Those are the conditions. Right. So, whatever it means to be sacrificial and generous and joyous, that's what we need. And that, you know, that obviously varies. The widow's might, you know, the widow gave right. what amounted to less than a penny to us. But Jesus said, she has given more than all the others, because for her that was a sacrificial gift. You know, and those who can come and sort of dump a bucket full of $100 bills in, and go home and not notice it, who has given more? It's not, it's not that God needs our money. God does not sit in heaven wringing his hands saying, I'm sure all those people down there give this week, because if they don't, then my will is not going to be done on earth. No. The issue is not what God needs, it's what we need. It's what yeah, we it's need to do, and that involves our relationship with money and the fact that we need to give it, okay? And, and some of it involves giving on a regular basis, ongoing, regularly, for the needs of the things of the kingdom and the needs of people you know, who, who are poor or hungry or have other kinds of needs. And then there's the opportunity to give extraordinary gifts in times of special need, over and above. Scripture talks a lot about tithes and offerings. And I believe what that means is that the tithe is the set amount that you've agreed you're going to give based upon your income on a regular basis. And that's going to be regularly, all the time. You know, they even talk about in the book of Acts the fact that the churches would decide, you know, and they would, they would gather up the money and, you know, that as they determined they would and then give it at the end of the week. Okay, so that's the regular thing. But then the offerings part, that's the ties, but the offerings part would be the over and above, the extraordinary giving, the extra that is needed in order to meet exceptional needs. That's why we have the reference to tithes and offerings. So uh, we need to have a sense of that, I think. And Luke 12, when we talk about how much people giving based upon how much they have, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. From the one who has been trusted with much, much more will be asked. Well. Inherent in that is the, the, the counter, which is those who have been given little are not going to be expected to give much, at least not financially. Right? There is, there is a, a balance there between what God has entrusted to us and what we are expected to give back to Him, how we are supposed to handle that. Okay. Now, as Christians, I think we need to see that there are ultimately three things we can properly do with our money. We'll get down to Proverbs 3 9 in a minute. I don't know why that. These things sometimes change after I prepare them and stick them on the computer <laughs> in terms of the, the uh, unfoldings. So, three things ultimately that we can properly do with our money. First, we can give it cheerfully to achieve, achieve God honoring purposes through our church, through other Christian ministries, directly to people who have need if it is done in a way that is honoring to God. Not so that we get credit for it. Not so that, you know, um, one of the things, because I do, I do major donor development training. I train people on how to do relation, have relationships with major donors and ask them for large gifts. One of the things that we run into a lot is that people are reluctant to, people who are part of the society, you know, who are in society in a, in a in, they say, if I go to them and ask them to give money for World Vision, for instance, or whatever else ministry is, then the next time their garden club is trying to raise, you know, they're going to come to me and ask me for $100,000 like they gave to this, or $10,000 or whatever it is. There's a quid pro quo that's built into the social expectations and those kind of uh, arrangements. That's not what we're talking about here. For a Christian, we give not so that we'll get credit or so that, you know, we then are obligated to give to somebody else. These are things that are honoring to God, and we should do it cheerfully, not reluctantly. The second thing we can do with, um, with our money is to spend it reasonably to meet personal needs and to fulfill personal desires. Now, meeting personal needs, obviously. Our needs, the needs of our family, the needs of you know, those close to us. And personal desires, you know, God gives us stuff for two reasons. For our own benefit, and that's not just for to meet our needs, but also for our enjoyment. Why is it that food tastes good? Why is it that flowers are colorful and smell good? You know, why is it that the birds that land in our water, you know, our, our fountain, are so many different colors? God creates things like that for our pleasure. God has created things for our pleasure. He is pleased when we 
appropriately find pleasure in the things he entrusts to us. So there is nothing wrong with finding joy in that. Now, if, if we are so dedicated to, to not just meeting our needs, but satisfying our desires, make, pleasuring ourselves with our money, that we don't give to things that are honoring to God, through the church, through ministries, through people's needs, then we have a problem. There's a reason why these are in this order, okay? We first give the things of God in ways that honor God, then we, and God will provide for us. We meet our own needs and we find pleasure in things. Now, there is nothing wrong with decorating your house, right? Now, if you decorate it in diamonds and sapphires and rubies and don't have any left over to care, you know, to give to anybody else, then you have a problem. But you see the balance there. And the third thing is to save it strategically in order to continue meeting needs in the future. Now, saving for future, either your needs or the needs of the church. For instance, to say, I am, you know, I'm set, setting up a trust that the church is going to benefit from. Or in my will, I am, you know, arranging for this to be a long-term benefit. Those are good things. Now, if you're saving money because you're frightened that you're not going to have enough, that's the wrong motivation. That is not honoring to God. So many people today are scared that they're not going to be okay, that they're not going to be taken care of. God wants us to be responsible. He wants us to have savings sufficient to meet our needs. But if we're doing it because we're fearful, then that means we don't trust God. It has to mean we don't trust God. And so we have to be very careful about that. Number, number one is obvious of these three. Two, we have to be careful that meeting our personal needs and desires does not become self-gratification for its own end. And the third one, saving to meet future needs, that is needs for ourselves and our family and for the things of God, does not happen out of fear, but rather out of a desire to see a longer-term benefit. That's legitimate. Okay? Proverbs 3.9 says, honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first produce of your entire harvest. Start with honoring God. You start there and you're going to be okay. With the first fruits, in other words, he gets the first. He doesn't get what's left over. So many Christians I know get their, get their check at the start of the month or whatever it is, and they spend on everything they want, and then if anything is left over, they give to God. No, there's a reason. Why not only Proverbs, but the whole Old Testament orientation was you give first to God. He is first. Why? Because He comes first. He is most important. All right? Any questions about that? Comment? Sure. Point two goes back to that thing with contentment again. Mm -hmm. You know, where where do you draw the line? Where is it that, where is enough enough? Right. And that's something we all battle with. I mean, we all have to define it. And, and the issue, the underlying issue is, am I really content with Christ? And There's a verse in Psalm 78, 3, or 25, maybe Psalm 78, 25. It says, And Lord, who do I have in heaven but you? And beside you, I desire nothing else upon the face of the Right. That is profound. Right. Absolutely profound. To come to a point where a man can be completely content. Right, it's very true. And when we talk about personal desires, those our spiritual health, our relationship with God, will greatly influence those personal desires. You know, my personal desire is to do something for somebody else's need, or to do something over and above exceptional for for the church, or for the things of God. That may be a personal desire. If my personal desire is to buy my third motorhome or my second boat, when I know that there are other needs out there that could be met, then I probably have a problem. But again, we do need to be careful, just like we say money itself is not wrong. God desires for us to enjoy our lives. That's why he makes things the way they are. He doesn't want us to not enjoy our lives. He wants us to find our contentment in him. But we can't, God does not call us all to be ascetic, you know, to give up all earthly uh, interests and desires. Um, and so... I think that there's a balance there. But you're absolutely I'm right. Not, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting you. No, no, no. No, I agree with you. You know, I, that our contentment should be in the Lord. And if it is, then we will find our personal exactly. desires changed. Exactly. Okay. But it is not 
it is not necessary to say what I want doesn't matter, which some people would try to go there. All right? Yeah. There's some wants that are that are good or at least fine. I mean, they're not a problem. Okay. So, as Christians, we, we just talked about the the. We'll do this and we'll take a break. Um, the three things we can ultimately properly do with our money. Now let's talk about the three things we need to, or three keys we need to follow regarding material possessions. This isn't money so much as this the stuff we have. First, enjoy things but don't cherish them. Another way to say that is don't love anything that can't love you back. All right, which Carolyn and I are always saying. You know, I love my car. No, you don't. At least I hope not, because it can't love you back. Colossians 3, 2, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. So, um, we, we do need to understand, when we say enjoy things, and this goes back to what I was saying before, some people have this image of God sort of leaning over the railing of heaven, watching us closely, and the minute we do something that's fun, he wants to say, stop that! Cut that out! We don't have any of that! No laughter! <laughs> that's not God. You know, God is not telling us don't enjoy things. He's telling us don't fall in love with things. God is pleased when we find joy and pleasure in things, as long as they're the appropriate things. Obviously, there are limits there. I don't even tell you what those are. But we are, it is fair for us to enjoy things, just don't fall in love with them. Okay? Secondly, share things joyfully, not reluctantly. 2 Corinthians 9, 7, and 8 says, Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. We should be excited about giving. There's a wonderful story. Um, Earl Palmer, our old pastor in Seattle, when many, many years ago, he was the pastor of Union Church in, the, in Manila, the Philippines. And he had, his family was young men, they were all you know, kids. But they decided that they were going to take an around-the-world trip, you know, and they could afford economy transportation from point to point, and they were going to stay with missionary families they knew around the world. Well, they didn't have a lot of money, but somebody came up to them and, and said, you know, Earl, Shirley, here's a hundred dollars. Spend it however you want to on this trip. Just enjoy it. It's mad money. It's not a lot, but it's a hundred dollars. Just, you know, for them, a hundred dollars then was a lot of money, probably. So they start out on this trip, and like the first missionary they, house they stop at, could you ask them to maybe step outside if they're going to talk? I find that, really find that instructive. Um, thank you. Um, the first house they stop at, in the course of like having the evening with this missionary family they're staying with, they find out that there's some particular need that exists. And one of their kids, you know, young kids, 10, 11, 12 years old, say, Mom, Dad, we can use that hundred dollars that they gave us. You know, this that'd be great. That would just meet what they need. And they said, right, we'll do that. And they gave them that hundred dollars. Well, like the next place they stopped, something else came up that, well, we could use that hundred dollars. And then the next place, the next place. And Earl says, you know, we probably spent that hundred dollars eight or nine times. <laughs> and we had so much joy. There's nothing we could have spent that hundred dollars on that would have given us more satisfaction and more joy than knowing in each case we were spending it on something that was a need that arose to us. That's what it means to give joyfully, not reluctantly. You know, none of their kids said, well, gosh, I was hoping we'd spend that hundred dollars on something fun. You know, Earl and Shirley had raised their kids right, and their kids were the ones that kept saying, oh, we can use that money for that need. And they got great joy, and they still tell that story. Other people, obviously, are just still telling that story. That's how we should understand our relationship to money and to be able to get joyfully, okay? Um, so those first two, enjoy things that don't cherish them, share things joyfully, not reluctantly. And third, think like a pilgrim, not like a settler. Matthew 6, 19, 21 says, Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, a couple things. I've talked on this, on this passage several times. One of the things, when it says, um, don't store up for yourself treasure in heaven, where moths and vermin uh, destroy. Do you ever have clothes that were eaten by moths? Were you wearing them at the time? Where were they? 
or in the closet or in, the, in, or in storage or in chest. So, and, and I've said this to men before, and you know, uh, the idea of um, rust, in fact, one version of this says where rust destroys. I said to the men, you know, do you have tools? They go, yeah. I said, have you ever had tools rust? And they said, yeah. And I said, well, did the tools rust while you were using them? No. When did they rust? When they've been sitting around a long time, weren't even being used. This is not saying, this passage is not saying don't have things that you use. It's saying don't have so much stuff that you have to store it all up. Again, it doesn't mean that you have to be using every tool every moment. You have to be wearing every article of clothing every moment. But at a certain point, we need to realize that enough is enough if so much of our stuff is in storage that it's being destroyed by rust and moths. So that's part of this. And again, if we are a pilgrim and we are moving forward, and I believe all Christians are really called to be pilgrims. You know the old song, uh, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through, my treasures are laid up there somewhere beyond the blue. Earth is not our home. We are ne never supposed to be fully settled here. And from a spiritual point of view, we're supposed to be moving forward with the clothes on our backs, with the tools in our hands that we need to use, and not trying to find a spiritual sense in which we're settled down. Because if we do that, then that stuff starts accumulating. Trust me. I, we, I've got so, so We've got so much crap, even though we've tried to give it all away, and we need to do it again. Now, for me, now, most of that crap is paper. <laughs> you wouldn't believe. I mean, I go through a case of paper about once a month, okay? And so they print all that stuff out, and then I've got all these notes and sermons, and the file cabinet's full, and boxes full. It's spilling over on my floor right now. Okay, I need to get rid of that stuff. But at a certain point, when it comes to material possessions and how we've spent our money, we need to recognize that we need to be ready to move as Christians. We need to be pilgrims. Pilgrims, by definition, are people on their way, not putting down roots. Okay. C.S. Lewis, um, well, let me first, another way to understand this is Jesus talked about the fact that, that you know, we're foreigners, we're aliens. Now, there's no song um, by Petra, you know, we're, we're strangers, yeah. we're aliens, we're not of this world. Yeah. That's very much what Jesus was talking about. We are not of this world. And, and so we can never really be settled here. Our home is somewhere else. And we have expectations of that home somewhere else. C.S. Lewis once said, if you find yourself unable to be satisfied by the things in this world, perhaps it's because you were intended for a different world. Well, we believe we are. And so we need to be aware of that and thinking of that and a pilgrim on the way to that, not trying to do everything we can to settle down here and accumulate as much stuff until it is destroyed by rust and moths. Okay? Jesus, um, or I'm sorry, Paul in Philippians 3.20 says, Our citizenship is in heaven. Not here. Don't ever feel like you're going to settle down here on earth. We're all, we're passing through. Okay? Let's take a break. Okay. Um, so we've talked about uh, three appropriate ways for us to spend money and three keys for how we should uh, use our material possessions. Now I want to give you a series of what I would call insights, things that we need to think about, be aware of as we go along. First, remember to use things and love people. In our culture, we have a terrible tendency to love things and use people. We get this completely backwards. Our lives are not about things. They're about God. And God has told us that it needs also to be about people. Okay? So it's not about us, it's not about things, it's about God, and it's about the people that God puts in our lives. When Jesus, and this is the passage you referred to earlier, John, when uh, Jesus was approached by a man in a crowd, and you get this feeling you sort of like just yelled out at Jesus from the back of the crowd, you know, um, make my brother share the inheritance with me. And Jesus said it. First he says, who am I to make decisions about issues like that? And then he says, then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in abundance of possessions. Possessions aren't the point. And I think there's a, it's important here that he said this to a man who was having a fight with his brother over material possessions. The brother, and Jesus was making the point, the brother's more important than the possessions. Possessions are not the issue, it's the people. Use things, love people. Okay, that's one. 
Secondly, remember that little things can't make a big difference. People who say, well, I can't afford to give much, so I won't give. No, the widow's might. Now, the widow's might, her two tiny copper coins, less than a penny's worth, did not change, you know, it did not fund the, you know, the orphan's needs for the next how long at the temple. But it made a huge difference. If for no other reason than that woman's contribution has come down to us 2,000 years later as a model of what it means to give, even if you only have a little. And Jesus held her up as a model that giving a little, if it is a sacrificial gift, is worthy of honor. All right? Now, that doesn't mean give two copper pennies when you've got a fat bank account and you're going to be okay. No, 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 no. That's not the way that works. The reason that she was noted is because that was for her a sacrificial gift. Right? She was giving more than she could spare, to quote Lewis again. Uh, but all through Scripture, little things make a difference. You remember that when David fought Goliath, you know, he killed him with a stone that he picked up, you know, a small stone, and he killed the giant with it. Right? God can take small things. Small things are great things when they are in God's hands. And so whatever we have, we put them in God's hands and He can do great things with them. Don't ever feel like, I don't have enough to make a difference. Okay? Third, remember that you can gain everything in this world and still be a big loser. Okay? You know, loser? Loser. Um. Yes? I enjoyed the movie The Bucket List because I thought that was very appropriate. But they wanted to do everything on the bucket list, but in the end, uh, uh, you know, the, the one guy was with his family yeah. and the other guy was looking in the window and, you know, knowing what the real gift was. And it wasn't all the possessions or all the tricks they could do or everything you could possibly dream of. Because we all have bucket lists, I know I do. Yeah. Well, I didn't see the movie, but if the, the, the principle you're, you're espousing is correct, and that is having stuff, doing things that money pay for is not what gets you happiness. Uh, Jesus said in Luke 9, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet lose or forfeit their very self? Okay, You can have everything by the world standards and lose it all. Whatever we gain in this world only has true value when we invest it in eternity by using it for the honor of God. Okay. So the world standards of what constitutes success are screwed up, it's simply wrong. If it is honoring to God, it is an investment in eternity, and those are the things that matter, no matter how poor you are. That's why we're going to be shocked, really shocked, I think, when we get to heaven and see who has the, prime, who has the closest seat at the table. Who of those that are truly honored in heaven? They're not going to be the ones that were successful by any kind of worldly standards. And maybe people that we knew that we had no clue that they were as close to Jesus as they were. Because they were quiet, they were humble, they spent a life in prayer rather than in bragging about themselves, whatever. Okay. A fourth insight to remember is remember that you can give away all you have and still invest it as well. Philippians 4, 16 and 17, not 18, Paul says, um, he's talking to the Philippians who had sent assistance to him, especially through Epaphroditus. And he said, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. Now, this is not, 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 not the prosperity gospel. It doesn't mean if you give $500 to God, he has to give you $5,000. Or that if you claim in faith that God's going to give you a, you know, a, a 500 series Mercedes, he has to do it. That's a lie from the pit of hell. God is under no obligation. But the fact is, um, and, and I think it was Randy Alcorn says, you can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead. In a very real way, Scripture talks in several places, that when we give away, our worldly possessions, our money, our material possessions, whatever, in Jesus' name, to the glory of God, it gets credited to our accounts, spiritual accounts in heaven, that we can then reclaim in eternity. Now, I don't know how that works. And, like everything else, if you're doing it in order to gain something later, if you think that I'm only, if you're only doing this because you want to get credit for it in heaven, 
then it, that isn't working for you. But if you truly give in Jesus' name to the glory of God, Paul, other parts of Scripture talk about the fact that Jesus himself, that that will be credited to your account in heaven. And we don't know what kind of account that is. It's obviously a spiritual account, since they're not going to need money there. Jesus in Mark 10 says, No one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, and he says in there along with persecution, and in the age to come eternal life. All right, There is a blessing to come in the age to come when we are prepared to set aside the things that everybody else in the world says is the, are the things of value for the sake of Jesus. All right? David Livingstone, you know David Livingstone, a uh, famous missionary across Africa, Dr. Livingstone, I presume. Okay? He once wrote, I place no value on anything I have or may possess except in relation to the kingdom of God. If anything will advance the interests of the kingdom, it shall be given away or kept only as by giving or keeping it I shall most promote the glory of him to whom I owe all my hopes in time or eternity. Everything, whether he kept it or gave it away, was motivated by the kingdom and how this would reflect to the glory of Christ. All right? The next insight to remember is that remember that you and I, all of us, will be called to give an account before God. Paul writes in Romans 14, 12, so that each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. We will stand before the Lord. And our lives will be reviewed. Now, this is not an issue of do we get saved or not. The first thing that happens is they open the book of life, and those names that appear in the book of life are, will spend eternity with him. And those whose names are not in the book of life will be you know, pointing toward the exit <laughs> to another, another eternity. You don't want to go there. Okay? But the fact is that then it says everyone's life will be considered in terms of how we've lived them. And I've said before that I think for some of us, the Lord will hopefully say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. For some, Jesus will say, you are one of my children, you will spend eternity with me, but I was very disappointed in how you lived your life. And no punishment, no criticism, no ostracizing, nothing that has ever happened to us will be quite the blow that we will experience when Jesus says, I was disappointed in how you lived your life. Now, that will, be, that will be forgiven and even forgotten as we spend eternity with Him. But we will be held to account for how we lived our lives. And one of the things is, how did we use the resources that God entrusted to us? All right? We will be called to stand before the Lord and give accounting. The next is, remember that we must be willing to give and even to give up. We have to, be, we have, to have a, a, a loose grip on everything in this world and be prepared to see it go. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 38 and 39, whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. We have to be prepared to go so far as not only lose our stuff, but lose our life if Jesus calls us to that. We have to hold things in a light grip. There's a wonderful story told about a missionary named Thomas Hearn, who was a missionary to the uh, Native Americans. And his party had been, um, that had been robbed. A band of Indians had stolen most of their provisions. And recovering from this difficulty as they moved forward, Thomas Hearn wrote the next day in his, in his diary, after having had most of their provisions stolen, he says, the weight of our baggage being so much lightened, our next day's journey was more swift and pleasant. <laughs> That's what it means to hold it lightly. Nothing is outside God's, God's control or outside His will. And when you say, you know, always look on the bright side of life, for a Christian, that's legitimate. God's will is in this too. And so, I love the fact that Hearn found a, a, a joy in it. Remember to be willing to give it up or to... Um, and to, to willing to give and to give up, uh, Paul writes in Romans 12, 1, that we are to offer our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. For this is our, is our appropriate worship. Okay. We are to be sacrifices on the altar of God. 
We are to be prepared to die for him. How can we then claim that we're not willing to release money and material possessions? You need to be prepared to give and to even give up on the things. I, um, I once got a call when I was working at World Vision. Again, you've heard this story some of you. I need to just stop saying that because it's always true. And um, fire department called me and said, um, your apartment's flooded. I lived in a condo complex and it was two story. It was a condo above mine. Well, I rush home and the firemen are there and they punched all these holes in the ceiling because a pipe had burst upstairs. And the way they find out about it is a woman was walking down the sidewalk in our condo complex. It was all a gated complex. And she looked over and she saw water coming out the window of my place. Now, <laughs> fortunately it hadn't filled up that far. What had happened was it was running down the wall and then coming out the window. But, you know, all, I got there and all my furniture was out in the yard. You know, the carpet was pulled out, holes in the ceiling and everything else. And it was a mess, okay? But I was in one of my, my more, um, you know, probably spiritually mature places at that time, I think. Because uh, right after that, a, a plumber showed up. And he was, this, he must have weighed 400 pounds. He was this huge man. And he said, oh man, this is a mess. And I went, well, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He went, I can't believe you'd say that. <laughs> wow, where's that coming from? I said, well, I'm a Christian. You know, it all work out. We'll be fine. You know? And he's like, couldn't believe it. He's just like, like I punched him in the face. Well, about two weeks or three weeks later, um, we had a plumbing problem in the apartment. And the guy had left his car. He came in and made sure, you know, he fixed the pipe and it all. And so I called him up, because I thought he seemed like a decent guy, and he did a good job, so I'll have him back over. And, and a woman answered the phone, and I said, I was calling for this, and she said, well, this is his wife. And he passed away <gasps> about 10 days ago. Oh, um, mm -hmm. Heart attack. I did not witness to him, but I hope, I've always hoped, that because of his reaction to my... You know, to my saying, it's okay that all of my junk's out in the yard and that there's holes in the ceiling and the carpet's been pulled up and everything's a complete mess. That's okay. We'll be all right. I've always hoped that maybe that was enough to make a difference mm -hmm. you know, uh, before his death. John? The stewardship of tangible resources. You know, for me, I think giving is not, a, not an issue. I, I, I think I got that one. I can, I can do that. But giving my privacy and my hospitality, that's costly. Mm -hmm. When you look at the tangible resources that deals with how do we how do we treat the stranger? How do we, you know, how do we how do we uh, where does hospitality come into this? Using our home, using our food as opportunity to reach out to others as well. And for me, that that is more difficult than giving money, because yeah. it involves me. Well, some of that does fit in in today's talk because it has to do with how we use our stuff, how we use our home, how we use our, and so that's valid. Well, next week when we talk about uh, stewardship of influence, we're going to get more into how we use our time and how we relate to other people. So we'll get into that as well. Well, I mean specifically yeah. our hospitality, right. opening our home. To, to others, right. and I don't mean just as a, as a social thing where we're on the same level and we like each other, so you come over to my house and eat, I'll go over to your house and eat. I'm not talking about right. that. I'm talking about bridging the gap right. with hospitality. And, and, and I, Carolyn and I are introverts, and so we don't, I mean, we don't go out a lot, we don't, um, but we've always enjoyed having people over. I mean, we had a group that we fed and gave wine to every Friday night for many, many years. And that was a joy to us. I mean, people say, how can you do that? Well, we don't want to go anywhere, so we make them come here. And then we give them food and wine, okay? But for us, there was great joy in that. And we were doing it a couple times a year. We, we, only, we only did it once, most recently. We do an open house at our house, in which we, you know, we put an ad in the newspaper. We invite, and I remember Bob said, you're nuts! It was <laughs> Bob's reaction we told him we put in. And last year, we think we got about 250 people. Yeah. And we had roast beef and ham and shrimp and turkey and 50 different kinds of other, you know, finger foods and, you know, everything from taquitos to mini quiches to, you know, uh, 
and on and on and on. And I don't say that because, you know, aren't you cool? Because people say, how can you? a lot of people are asking, how can you do this? You advertise it in the newspaper? <laughs> you can't believe how much pleasure that gives us. Right? The only possible reason we would not want to do it again is that we actually couldn't afford it. Which, that may be a danger to some this year when we come to Christmas. But um, other than that, there is nothing, even as introverts, even as people who, for whom privacy is very important to us. I don't like noise. I don't like crowds. <laughs> but that crowd, when we can share and, you know, man, we need to get twice as much shrimp next year. <laughs> That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. They love the shrimp. Okay. I'm going to do two crock pots full of my Italian pot roast next year. Okay. Um, and again, that's not tuning our horn. It's, it's a way of saying from practical first-hand experience, how, even though we're not, you know, that we're introverts, when we do that, we get so much joy out of it. We just have a, a great time. So this year, we'll probably, we're going to try to have one at Christmas, and if we can, you guys all will come. All right. The, the seventh and last sort of uh, insight to remember is to remember to trust in the one who provides. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. If we trust in the one who provides, then there will be provision for our needs. And that's not, it's easy to say that. It is not always easy to live that. I mean, I'm looking at the reality right now. We're building a church. And we're committed to building it at no debt. Well, a few people have been very generous. Other people have been moderately generous. And we're reaching a place where we're going to need more money. And I think they're getting tired of having me ask for it. And so I'm, I'm very prayerful right now. How are we going to deal with that? What are we going to do? Because we're going to need more money. And we have a very limited congregation. We've already done miraculous things. I don't know if you've been over to see it, but go over there. You know, it's, it's I think, astonishing. It is a, a miracle from God. And he can do the rest of the miracle. I have no doubt about that. He may say, we're going to wait a while until people wake up to the fact they need to get more. Um, or whatever. That's in his will. And so the thing, I, you know, I'm, I'm a get it done kind of guy. And so part of me is, well, come on, Lord. Let's go. <laughs> you know, um, this is your church. This is your project. Pope people. Well, he will when he will. And my job is to do my part and then to simply say the rest of it is in the Lord's hands. He will do what he will do. Um, that's not easy. And I would appreciate your prayers for that project and for me as we, as we work through all that. I mean, if we had the resources, Carol and I would say, you know, here's another 25000 or whatever. We don't have it. We're pretty much tapped out in terms of what we do. Um, but we need, we need to move forward on that. So. Now, when we give to the things of God through Christian ministries, one of the issues is, okay, I, I want to give to my church, and I want to give to things of the kingdom, Christian ministries. There's a lot of them out there, a lot of really good ministries out there. How do I decide who I should give it to? Because, you know, unless you're a, a Saudi Arabian prince or Bill Gates, you don't have unlimited resources. So how do you decide where to give it? Most people... And I'll put the first one up there. Um, most people want the ministries they support to be very efficient. They always look at the efficiency numbers. And they always want to know that there are measurable results from what's happening. Well, those aren't bad things. All other things being equal, those are good things to look at. But those are not the first criteria we as Christians should be looking at. Because we as Christians are not as concerned as the first priority for efficiency which those things measure. The first thing we need to be aware of, the most important criteria, is that the ministry we're supporting is actively seeking to be spiritually faithful to God and His Word. And I'll give you an example. I think you all know that I've done a lot of work in the last few years with Jews for Jesus. Jews for Jesus as a ministry, I mean, they do a lot of media and sort of attention grabbing, but most of their ministry to Jewish people, and to Gentile people too, they have five times as so many Gentile converts as Jewish converts, um, but when they're in a city, almost all of their ministry is one-on-one. -on -one. You know, they go out on the streets wearing Jews for Jesus t-shirts, and they have broadside handouts, 
They meet people one on one. They go in the cafes, and this is a this is a face to face personal ministry. The fact is, they don't get thousands and thousands and thousands of converts. They'll do a campaign in a city, and it may cost them $250,000 to do the whole thing, and they may get 30 converts. And you'll say, well, that's not very efficient. You know, that, you know, that doesn't... Well, people would say, well, I'm going to give my money to the Jesus film instead, because they get a lot of converts, which is great, except the Jesus film doesn't work with Jewish people. Okay, the ministry to Jewish people, the way they do it, as hard as it is, and trust me, if there was an easier way to do it, they would want to, because this isn't easy to go face to face wearing a t-shirt that says Jews for Jesus when you're in Jewish communities in major cities. They get spat at and kicked and cursed, you know, the whole thing. But they talk about the fact that the converts they have are hand-picked fruit. Because the only way you can reach those people is face to face. They sh completely shut off media messages about Jesus and that sort of thing. I mean, they've made efforts to try to break down some of those barriers in order to open conversations, but conversation is the only way to do that. So, do we, because it's not as efficient to evangelize Jewish people in that way, do we say we're not going to do that anymore? We're only going to spend our money on more efficient ways to do it? Or do we look at that and say that while it by usual standards, it may not be all that efficient. It is faithful to the Word of God and to His desire, and He's being honored in it. Is that not the primary criteria? Sometimes we have to be willing to be less efficient in order to be more effective in some ways. Now, all other things being equal, I mean, if I were help working with two international relief organizations that are feeding people, and I know they're both committed to the Lord, they're both very committed as Christians, and one of them is, is much more efficient in how they do it. And sometimes that's not easy to say. It's not just a, a percentage, you know, the idea of how, what percentage of the money they spend on fundraising and administration. When I was working for World Vision during the African famine, back in the 80s, World Vision invested in um, renting warehouses, security guards for those warehouses, they had their own fleet of trucks, their own drivers, their own guards for those trucks, which meant when they brought food supplies, a boatload of food came into East Africa, for instance, they were the ones, World Vision got the food from the boat to the warehouses, they kept it secure, they then took it from the warehouses where it was distributed, it got where it was going. Other, and, and as a result of that, they had, a, what by most standards, you know, there's like 17% overhead. And people look and go, oh, I'm not going to give to them. This other organization says they'll do it for 2% overhead. And the end result was that a lot of the food, because they didn't spend the money on the logistics, a lot of the food never got where it was supposed to go. So sometimes it's not as obvious as you might think. Okay, I'm going off on that. But the idea is, are they being faithful to the things of God and to honor Him? And sometimes the kind of criteria we think mark efficiency may not be the right criteria. Secondly, remember God does not need our money to see His will done. When we get to the things of God, God's okay. He's doing fine, thank you. That um, we need to give because we feel that an organization is honoring God, not because there's some need that won't, poss won't possibly be met <coughs> unless we give money for that. Honor God first. That's the first priority. Third, God is ultimately responsible for the results. That's, you know... That's true in the church. Our, our congregation, as an example, we've had a huge number of people for medical reasons go back to the U.S. and Canada. Or people who have died, and then their spouse has gone back. In fact, in terms of major givers to our church, we lost like half of our significant donors to our church because of going, people going back for medical reasons. And things. Well, that's up to God. I mean, that's not something I can even, I can feel bad about. I mean, I, I I do. The fact that our attendance is down because of that, the fact that um, you know there's not as much money for us to do some of the things that we want to do, that troubles me. But I don't blame anybody, and I don't blame God, and I don't feel a failure myself on that account. I simply say, you know, that's Lord's, that's God's job. At a certain point, I have to say, the final result is God's. If I'm being faithful, if the people who are leading this church are being faithful. And we have to believe that too when we give to the work of God. 
the ultimate results are in his hands, not in ours. We need to understand that God will ensure that resources are distributed according to his desires. The ministries that God, that are honoring God, that he wishes to see move forward, will move forward. It's all his. He will distribute it. Now, he may expect us to do our part. In a mysterious way, God calls on us to play a part in that distributing of the resources and funds. And so he may call on us to do that, but ultimately it's in his hands. And visible results from faithful ministry may not be evident for years or even generations. I think that's true with Jews for Jesus. You know, the number of times, even now, we can see the number of missionaries in Jews for Jesus right now, especially younger missionaries who were saved because of the ministry of Jews for Jesus, or whose parents were saved two generations back because of the Jew, of Jews for Jesus, and I'm just using them as an example, is quite extraordinary. You know, that it literally leads to a raising up of a whole generation of Jewish Christian missionaries. We don't see that right away. You don't see the benefit of that. You don't see the multiplying of that kind of thing. We often will not see the results of some of the greatest of Christian ministries for a while down the road. We have to say, what is most honoring to God? Trust Him to provide, provide the, you know, the end produce that's needed. <coughs> Trust Him with those resources and move forward. Okay? Ultimately, when we talk about how we use our money and, and material possessions, Luke 6, Jesus said, Give, and it will be given to you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now our experience is that it doesn't always happen today, or tomorrow, or next week, or maybe it won't even happen in this lifetime. There's no promise that this is going to happen right away. But the promise is that as we are willing to give to the things of God, He will bless. And He won't just bless. He will bless, pressed down, shaken together, running over, poured into our lap. The measure we use will be measured to us. If you are stingy with God, God will be stingy with you. If you are generous with God, God will be generous with you. If you are sacrificially generous to the things of God, God will be sacrificially generous to you. And again, we can't claim that that's not prosperity gospel. We don't even know if that's going to happen in this life, but we're promised it will happen. And we believe the promises. Any questions?